Hi, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for joining us for Advanced Echo Teaching this week. Um, we're going to talk about contrast echo today. Uh, we've got a few cases to try and talk us through the, the, the real indications of what contrast echo is for, which is for LV opacification. Um, but there are some areas outside of it, which uh, I'd love to show you if we've got time, but also we'll obviously go through some exam cases. So let's just see how we go and I'll go through the important stuff to know from a clinical perspective for the exams and then we'll try a few other other bits after that. Okay, so when we're talking about contrast echo, the bit I'm going to be focusing on here is not really agitated saline. I'm talking about echo contrast, which in Australia is called Definity. There are other drugs around, uh, particularly used in America, which can be called things like Sonovu or Optison are probably the most commonest ones that are used in America and the UK, but the one here in Australasia, uh, which is licensed is Definity. And what that actually is, is a chemical compound, means that you, after you've activated it, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a second, is that you mean you get little bubbles that if they were not under ultrasound um, sort of power, you can see as they look up a bit like in the sort of top left of the screen there, it's about a three micrometer wide gas bubble. And it's stabilized because the gas in it is often not air it's something like a, it's like an octafluoropropane uh, whatever the hell that means but it's basically it's a stable inert gas that's then surrounded by a lipid shell which means that it's stable and it means that that will stay in your circulation for about three minutes and it's small enough so that it can pass through capillaries and that's obviously really important so that if you inject it into a vein it goes through the pulmonary circulation and comes over into the systemic circulation all right now the beauty about these little gas bubbles is when you put them under ultrasound power and there's an example of this tiny little bubble under ultrasound power in the top right of the picture here, the bubble goes up and down like that very, very quickly. And you can imagine what that does when you've got a gas liquid uh, interface and the difference in the acoustic impedance from a physical perspective, the ultrasound waves just go crazy and they just get reflected really powerfully. And that means that you get really beautiful pictures of the inside of the heart. Okay, so it's, uh, it highlights the inside of a blood vessel and it means that you can see very clearly if there is a thrombus sticking in there, for example. The only downside about these things is that these bubbles, they're stabilized, but they're not phenomenally stable. So you can't image with the same power that we normally image with, or what's known as the mechanical index. So normally when we're imaging with standard imaging, it's uh, standard 2D imaging, it's uh, a mechanical index of around about one. And we use about 10% of that power when we're imaging with contrast. So it's about a mechanical index of 0.1. And that stops the bubbles getting burst open and no longer having that property of reflecting ultrasound. So, absolutely. And I'll, sh I'll show you the setting and how, how you do it all, okay? So this is what the vial looks like for Definity. So the bottom left image, that's what a standard vial looks like. It's about one point something mil of a clear fluid. You have to stick it in the vial mix for Definity. And uh, I think there are different ones for different companies, obviously. And that vial mix shakes it 3000 times in 45 seconds. And that makes this kind of white emulsion. You draw up into 20 mils. Uh, and you can inject it either a mill at a time or you can put it in a syringe driver and just have that pump going in over half an hour or 40 minutes or something. Okay. And this is what it looks like. Um, so that you get this picture when you've got this low mechanical index. So again, it's about 10% the power of what a normal ultrasound image is. But the inside of the LV is lit up and looks bright white because of all the sound waves that get reflected back off it. And so that helps you try and look for thrombus is the main indication. Please stop me if you want to, if you want to. Uh, this is safe. This is a very, very safe drug. There were some initial problems, I think about 10, 15 years ago, when it got a black box warning from uh, the US uh, Drug Administration Committee. And that has since been vastly, vastly downgraded and we've got multiple evidence, particularly from a guy called David Platts here, who works up in, um, uh, I want to say Prince Charles in Brisbane. I may have got that wrong, but he's, oh yeah, Prince Charles, so there it is, isn't it? Uh, he's done some of the biggest data uh, in thousands of patients uh, using, this, uh, using this drug and has shown it to be a very safe, uh, very safe drug. 
Um, there's a wonderful paper in here which I, uh, which is a wonderful indication of why you've got to be really careful on how you analyze statistics. So this paper in the top right in jack of all things, there's a really solid uh, journal which describes actually if you give critically ill patients contrast, they get better. So there's a wonderful example there of saying that those who have contrast versus those that don't, if you just look at odds ratio for survival, that those who have contrast do better in a statistical analysis based on that wonderful p-value of 0.05. I, I think there's probably a few other things that are going in there. It's probably some confounders that they must have missed um, because uh, I don't think mortality is affected whether you've got, whether you're given contrast or not, you've got to do something with the results which they didn't really go into. So I, I don't think that's a great, paper, but it's certainly what we can take away from it is that contrast is safe in the critically ill patients. The ones who I don't give it to are if you've got any kind of massive hole in the heart with either a VSD or an ASD, because we don't quite know what happens uh, if a lot of those bubbles burst in the, uh, in the cerebral uh, field. So we don't give a hell of a lot to those with massive VSDs or ASDs. You've got to be careful if people are hemodynamically unstable and we monitor them just like we do with all medications. And those, uh, or if you've got an allergic reaction to any blood product or, um, or contrast in the past before. And I have seen one reaction to it, which was an anaphylactic type reaction and the standard rules applied for teaching with, uh, dealing with anaphylaxis and that case got better. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell this story seeing as we're being filmed, but I might as well say. Um, so the only, the, so as say, we say this is a very strong drug and we sort of lecture and we say this all over the world. And a friend of mine who uh, was a cardiologist, a, he was doing a contrast study on the grandmother of the head of the cardiology department of the hospital he'd just been at. And that was the lady who had the allergic reaction to the contrast. So if it's gonna happen, it's always gonna happen to your ex-boss's mother. So just be very careful um, with that. Uh, let's do a case study. I might just switch and do, a, uh, do it on a different screen, if I may. Can I just ask one question? Of course. That? You mentioned that you know, if there's any reaction to blood products, then we shouldn't be using that. I didn't get that. Yeah, so it's a lipid. So it's the lipid shell uh, yeah. that can have the reaction with that. Because We call it a flutrin carbon because it's a bit like albumin. I think it was, that was also more a problem with... Uh, that was more a problem when in the early, the first generation. The Definity is a second generation agent and we're getting towards the third ones are just becoming safer and safer. Right, let's see how I can do this now. Great. Can you all see that okay? Can you guys see my screen? You can see the uh, echo packs? Brilliant. Yep. Okay, uh, let's start off with... Uh, let's go. Okay, so this is the first echo image and there are a couple of principles that we're just gonna focus on first of all. So um, exams, Danielle, um, are you happy to kick off this one? It gets harder, so you're lucky you're the first person. Yes, that's fine. Sorry, I'm just eating my lunch while I'm listening to you. That's why I don't have my camera on, but I'm happy to, um, happy to talk. <laughs> what, do you wanna be the second? No, no, the no, I'm all good. Yeah, I'm good to go. Sure? Yeah. Okay, no uh, all right, so just now imagine, so the stem of this question could be along the lines of, Let's make it up. So we've got a 74, whatever it was, that 70 year old guy who has got, say, uh, critically ill, hypertensive or something, and comes in with uh, shock uh, and a low GCS. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're just going to take some principles along and just talk to me. Uh, let's just, first of all, just, just report a few images because each time you see these kind of images, you've got to have a knee jerk reaction to take it to the next stage in the exam, in my opinion. Go, go for it with this one. Okay, so this is a parasternal long axis view. Um, uh, the LV cavity, uh, I think, appears dilated, just eyeballing it, and I'd like to measure that to confirm. Um, the LV systolic function is reduced, um, probably moderately so based on these images. The anteroceptal wall is contracting poorly and not really thickening um, and is probably more affected than the posterior lateral wall. 
um, left atrium looks normal size, mitral valve, aortic valve, from what I can see, appear normal, and only the very um, proximal portion of the aortic root is visible. Uh, it's a fairly zoomed out view. I'm looking posterior to the heart to see if I can see an obvious pleural or pericardial effusion there. I don't think I can. Um, so, yep, dilated and poorly functioning um, LV. Okay, talk to me about regional wall motion abnormalities. Yeah, so I think the, um, I think the anteroceptal um, basal and mid portion that we can see there, and you can see a little bit of the apical um, region as well, um, all look uh, probably akinetic. Um, and I think there's hyperkinesis of the um, visualised portion of the posterior lateral wall. So this is a, um, a short axis view at the level of the mitral valve. I'm looking to see if I can confirm the regionality that I um, thought I could see on the previous images. Yeah, it's difficult. The anterior lateral wall is not well visualised in this image, but I think it's probably down. Um, again, I think all of the regions are hypokinetic, um, probably the um, uh, inferior and infraceptal regions um, less affected than the other regions. So here's an um, a apical four-chamber view focused on the left ventricle. Again, I'd say there's moderate systolic dysfunction of the LV. The apex is akinetic. Um, the uh, anterolateral um, basal region is um, contracting a little bit and the septum is doing something, but I'm concerned about the apex. And in this setting where the LV appears quite dilated, um, then the apex um, ought to be more closely investigated um, for the presence of thrombus, considering that that um, segment appears akinetic. And I'd be interested to know a little bit more about the patient's history, whether he's got a history of coronary artery disease that would explain these changes. Yeah, beautiful. So, anything else? Um, mitral valve in this view appears um, uh, normal thickness and, um, and opening and closing normally. Um, I would be, you know, wanting to look at some um, uh, colour Doppler, see whether there's any functional valve, valve abnormalities affecting the mitral valve. Cool. So, what was the stem of the question? Now, that was great, by the way. I think that's pretty good. Um, uh, so, really nice uh, candour and speed and discussions and... Certainly nothing you said was wrong. I'll, if, if, you, if I'm allowed to, I'll, I'll criticize just a little bit in terms of for the exam, mm -hmm. using words like the LV function, I think you described it as reasonable, and then you said oh, it's, it's probably moderately dysfunctional. Just say, just come out with a term, just try and be efficient in yeah. your speech, because you said things like were reasonable, or the uh, antiseptal was down. Uh, you said the apex is doing something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna further investigate the apex. Yeah, that's quite relaxed. Uh, relaxed rhetoric we've got to for the exam try and make it concise you know that is so moderate moderate systolic dysfunction. Function, hypokinetic akinetic exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. and take me to that next bit because again what was the stem of the question with someone yeah who's, sorry who's, the who's, stem was that he came in shocked with yeah. a reduced conscious state nice um so that's significant because uh if if there um, is a potential, so the, the cause of the reduced um, conscious state, obviously there's a very broad differential for that, um, but one potential uh, cause could be uh, a stroke. And yep. if there's a potential cardiac source of embolism, then that would be very significant. So how do you go on and so, because the examiner obviously have a prompt to get to you, but we're gonna have, there's a marking grid that if we have to give multiple prompts, it sort of pulls your score down a little bit. One okay. or two prompts, no one's gonna, no one's gonna uh, argue about, and certainly obviously you'd have passed with what you're saying, but it's just, you, you know where the examiner's going because it's all related to the STEM, right? And if there's a reduced level of consciousness and your apex is down, you said we've got to further investigate it, just tell the examiner what you mean by that. And so that's gonna be my next question. What do you mean by further investigating the apex? Yeah, so I'd, uh, I'd image it in multiple imaging planes yeah. uh, with the image zoomed in uh, onto the apex. So I would also look in the apical two chamber and in the long axis view. Um, in each of those views, I would put a color Doppler box over the apex to see whether we can see flow going all the way to the apex. Um, and in that image that you just showed, um, there is this, yes, I can see a uh, um, a linear um, structure, which I think um, uh, is adjacent to an echo density located at the apex, 
which appears to be moving with the LV wall um, and could represent laminar thrombus in that region. And I don't see any colour um, filling that portion of the LV apex. And so that is suspicious of a mural thrombus in that region. Beautiful. So fantastic. Right. So then you've got off axis imaging. We're going to use colour. We're going to put the focus position on the apex rather than anywhere else. So that's probably not exactly perfect. And the last thing to say is you, you can consider echo contrast to go and examine the area as the reference standard. Yeah. 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 So scaled. Oh, the color scale. Yeah, good call. So you can actually reduce that scale down because we're often looking for low flow states. So I think whenever you've got apical akinesis or you've got regional warm motion abnormalities, I guess, particularly at the apex, you've got to go searching for that blood clot, which means the off-axis imaging, the uh, zoom up at the top, using colour and trying to see if it fits in with the clinical situation. Um, and in my opinion, we should be doing a lot more contrast if people have any kind of apical akinesis, because I'll show you where I've missed clots. Yeah, so very, very nice pickup. And so what are we seeing? in these images so i'll just flick through some of them at a time so these are um the apical um images uh again i think that was a four chamber and this is either a two chamber or a long axis yeah. with the use of uh, echo contrast and these confirm an area adjacent to the apex of the lv which is not filled by contrast uh, and also is not filled by the um, uh, by the uh, the LV wall itself. Um, so that void there would be consistent um, with a thrombus. Uh, there's no contrast at all filling that region, and yep. so that would indicate that the region itself doesn't have any um, uh, any circulation. Um, so that would be consistent with a thrombus rather than, for example, a thickened area of LV wall or some other intracardiac mass, which would be unlikely in this region anyway, um, and would always be more likely to be a thrombus adjacent to an area of akinetic myocardium. Very nice. Can Very I just nice. make one comment here? Like sure. Based on the 2D picture and the color Doppler, I was almost certain that there's a thrombus then in this particular case, I don't think I need to do contrast imaging. Really? Well, you just got yourself the second case. <laughs> <laughs> in this particular patient I'm talking about. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and I, I agree. I mean, I guess it's, you've, got to, you've got to weigh it up and it's based on clinical history as much as anything. I just It's really easy to get it wrong, I reckon. And I'll, I'll show you this case where I thought it was the other way around. That's the reason you shouldn't open your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's like talking up in a specialist meeting. If you say something wrong, you immediately get, you get the uh, portfolio. Um, so, um, why don't we get to the... I think we're all going to know which way this is going. So just in the meaning of time, we'll just sort of flick through. So if we've got the same, this is a stroke workup in a patient who is 55, 50, 60, something like close to 70, so 67 or something. And you can see that we've got, you know, difficult images, right? But it looks like this patient's had a stroke and we need to figure out what's going on and we've got poor systolic function. Short axis isn't much better but we can see that there's some form of systolic dysfunction. Apex does look a little bit better, all right? So first of all, Vishal, what walls have we got here? So endolateral and infraceptal. Fantastic. And then what's happening in the apex? You're talking about regional wall motion abnormalities. What do you think? So in the LB apex, there's uh, some suspicion of some um, ecogenic structure, which is got independent motion is not moving within the LV wall. And in terms of apex of the left ventricle, it's not akinetic, I think. It's probably- Not akinetic? Yes, I think hypokinetic too. There we go. There yes. we go. <laughs> That's one of the uh, well-known uh, yeah. stages of uh, regional wall motion abnormality. Normal hypokinetic, not akinetic and akinetic. So it's uh, uh, probably hypokinetic. Okay. okay. Um, so, my differentials would be I need to rule out thrombus and also the artifact 
Yes. So I'll be doing, you know, off-axis imaging and we'll look, looking yeah, in the yeah, other yeah, two yeah, chamber yeah. and three chambers. So here's your off-axis imaging. I don't know which axis is this. So but... this is the, I think the RV, that's the, so the top of the LV. So we're trying to look at that mass that you were seeing mm. there. Yeah. Coming in and out. Can I also persuade you there's SEC going in there? So we've got severe systolic dysfunction. We've got SEC that's in there. I, I think the apex is akinetic. It's just being pulled. It's actually not thickening. And what's the definition of akinetic versus hypokinetic? 50%. And akinetic is obviously zero. So I, I think that's being pulled, but obviously I think it's one of the hardest things yeah. to try and get agreement on. I think this wall here, the infraceptal wall is hypokinetic. Yeah. So it's kind of LAD territory mm -hmm. is, is down, particularly, you know, sort of distally. And then we can go off axis. And again, that looks mm, really yeah. bloody suspicious. But again, it's really hard imaging. We can have a look with color. And I haven't got a great color one in there, I'm afraid. And especially in this linear structure that's sitting in here. All right. But then when we put the contrast in there, we certainly got maybe sluggish flow. But this is someone who I felt confident there was a clot there. And, and really easily, it just shows straight away that you don't have any kind of filling defect there. Um, so I just, I, I think if it's not really an expense, it's a pretty serious mm -hmm. diagnosis to make. I don't think it's a, if, I don't think it's, if, if you think there's definitely a clot there, I don't think it's that much to have to have a, a reference standard because it's, it's about $100, $150 per vial. I don't think the manufacturers encourage this, but you can use two vials for one, for, uh, sorry, take one vial, split it into two syringes, or sometimes even four syringes, and just use a few mils per patient, because you don't need a lot of medication to, to get just an LV pacification. But the drug only lasts for 24 hours, so you need to make sure you've done it in a sterile manner and use it within 24 hours. Um, if you're gonna use patients apart from each other, um, what my cardiologist friend Fraz suggests is that you don't take all of the syringe out and put it in the 20 mil syringe and separate it out. You just leave it in the vial and take out what you need. Um, is it any role of pulse wave? Yes. Pulse wave Doppler, interesting. And so maybe we'll talk about that in, in the, why don't we do one more case and then I'll show you. Um, and then I'll answer that question. So you could talk pulse wave Doppler. Um, can I ask? Um, with regards, and Daniel mentioned this before, if you've got, a, say, an interventricular wall tumour, sarcoma or rhabdomyosarcoma or something, how does that differ compared to a thrombus or a mural thrombus? Can I again show that? That's again, it goes into the, the next part. We'll do one more thing, which, because uh, you asked the question, you're going to get this one now. <laughs> Is it, oh, sorry, is anyone else doing their exams there? Who else have we got? There must be other people doing their exams, aren't me. Uh, Sam, just, just um, on that last Hi. case, uh, <laughs> um, what, do you think that's just near field artifact then that was showing up in the apex there? Absolutely. So near field artifact, echo is not great as anyone who's tried to stick in a line using echo will know that it's not very good in the near field with the way the phased array probe works because of the, the physics means that it's, you need to have, a, you know, the, diff, the, the different piezoelectric crystals fired at different times, which means that it's great from about the five centimeter mark on. That means that it's rip roaringly open for near field artifacts, which I think are caused by that, that phased array then rebounding off the, the ribs. Um, in a couple of weeks time, we, we're gonna have um, Robert Gill, who's gonna come and talk to us about artifacts. He's probably the, one of the wow. world experts on artifacts. And he's, uh, we can ask him that question, exactly what near field artifact means, because I'm probably making it up. But it's, it's something, it's, it's just not great in that first five centimeters and it's open for those near field artifacts. So hence the off axis imaging, using the color, using the contrast. Um, uh, yeah, Ben, we actually got Arnie here as well. Arnie, are you happy to have a crack at the last one? Yes. It's, it's relatively straightforward, I guess, from the last one, so you're probably getting the idea of where we're heading. And what I want you to try and help me out with this one is trying to tell me acute versus chronic clots, all right? So you, do you remember that first one with that very sort of laminar curved structure to it? Just take me through it with our boy here. So this guy's young, unfortunately, and he's only something like 33 years old, and he's got a terrible heart. Um, so again, just in the meaning of time, he might just show you the, the key images, and I just want you to talk me through the, the contrast part. So he's obviously got horrific LV systolic function, we can see here, uh, poor 
mitral valve opening. You can imagine if there was an yep. M mode through it, you'd have a very poor anterior mitral valve opening or E point separation. So a lot of cardiomyopathy picture. Beautiful. And then we had these kind of pictures on the apical view. So the apex was really hard, but it looks like his LV is just filled with thrombus almost, doesn't it? Yeah, so the, <clears throat> this is an off-axis uh, uh, four-chamber view. Mm. There's quite significant sort of lobular increased echogenicity around the apex and the uh, anterolateral wall. Um, so features, if you're talking about uh, chronicity versus acute, so there's a high suspicion of a thrombus. Doesn't particularly look like an artifact. Could it be non compacted myo myocardium? That would be another differential here to think about. Really nice in a young patient, absolutely. Good on you. Um, but so the echogenicity would make me uh, worry about that this, there's some chronicity to it. Yep. Very nice. Um, so yeah. the idea being, sorry, if it's more echogenic, it's older because it's got some form of. Sort of either calcification or just hardening from it being there. Very nice, yep. Uh, and then the other thing I would look at, it also appears a little bit in, at the margins of it, that it's maybe more echogenic than in the center, whether it, there's a, sort of some lysis starting in the center, or also make me suspicious that it's chronic. Um, and then, of course, the, the nature, sort of a pure pretest probability in this patient, this is a long-standing chronic condition. Uh, that it it would also support that. I'll just show a couple um, more off-axis images. More off-axis imaging with sort of similar appearance that we've just mentioned. Sort of a, a bright sparkly margin and attached to the wall uh, with a sort of firm base on the wall. Yeah. And I guess it's a bit more of the same. But again, this, so you can see this is a terrible view for apical four chamber view or something, but that's because we just slid the whole probe uh, laterally a little bit and then just tilted it around and sort of aimed more from the side and you get some quite nice views focusing on the top. And it's important to have your focus position uh, adequate. All right. Uh, where is the contrast? Uh, Oh, God, sorry, I think I've messed it up and I haven't got the... Oh, there we are. Sorry. So I think the um, yeah, everything, as you were saying, is correct. We did the contrast study to be absolutely certain because he wasn't the easiest to analyze. And as you were saying, I think it's really important to try and make sure you got the diagnosis. But the comparison between the one that Danielle reported and this one, as you're saying, the chronicity, we've got a much brighter structure here it's got irregular edges it's maybe got a softer core it's uh you know it looks like it's uh you know it's it's uh, organized almost and it's so it's been there for longer and i think that they're not hard and fast rules but certainly this suggests it's a more chronic picture as opposed to sort of laminar more hom homogeneous less echo dense uh structure that we had from danielle's um uh case can you just point when, like the black one is acute, right? Yeah. Oh, so I think when uh, from Danielle's remember Danielle's case where it had that big that oh, laminar, yeah, yeah. the whole thing across. Um, I, I'm gonna say acute. I don't mean it happens in you know minutes. I mm -hmm. think it's happening mm -hmm. over you know probably days to maybe weeks. Yep. This looks like it has been there for sort of the weeks to months to me. Um, and uh, as it gets more organised and uh, and more sort of shriveled and calcified, and then it's becoming irregular in shape and it's almost becoming more. Uh, mobile then and this guy was actually having a stroke workup in a 33 year old and it's got to be a cardiac cause right you need to get this guy on warfarin as soon as you can all right so why don't i show you a uh, nice one Arnie. um any questions uh, about that from anyone so far all right well let's show you a couple of the other ones that um um yeah just a question uh, is there any reason for false positives with contrast like uh, in the sense you know false uh, false positives so to have a filling defect filling defect yeah. not a thrombus yeah 
I mean, I think you're kind of feeling defect to say there's a mass there. That's all you're going to say. And it's just going to answer some of Ben's questions. So, I mean, I guess other things can cause filling defects that aren't thrombus, such as tumours. And I'll try and show you how we investigated a case just a, a short while ago. Um, I think maybe, maybe let me answer that again. I'll just flick through these cases. Uh, and I've mentioned things a few years ago. So I'll try and answer both that one, false positives, so I'll talk about pulse wave Doppler or Doppler in general in contrast. We'll talk about their sarcoma and we'll talk about false positives as I go through it. I'll hopefully answer those questions. And apart from the thrombus, what would be the other indications for the thrombus? I'll show you right now. We'll answer all of those questions combined, okay? So very quickly, if you're gonna do this, you're gonna do these things, this is how to perform it. Uh, you've gotta have your contrast drawn up in your vial mix. You need consent for the procedure. Uh, because it does have some risks, and the risks are of an anaphylactoid or anaphylactic reaction in particular, and those are extremely rare, somewhere in the region of 1 in 5 to 1 in 10,000 respectively for those. So if they're going to happen to you, they'll happen with your best mate's mum or something, so just be careful. And you need cardiac respiratory monitoring for at least 20 minutes after the procedure and during the procedure. You can have side effects such as feeling... Uh, you know, pressure or warmth uh, around the pelvic region for some reason, lower back discomfort, you can have tachycardia, you can have bradycardia. Uh, so just standard minor reactions are also possible. <laughs> Giving it your mother-in-law, I highly recommend they'll never be harmed at all. But, uh, isn't that nice? um, I don't think I'm, I'm in danger of my mother-in-law watching these videos. I think. Um, so if you're going to do it, if you've got a standard 2D picture like we've got on the screen at the top there, when you're doing it on the GE machines, if you choose a different preset, there's often these presets which are for the lower mechanical index. And as soon as you do it, you get a picture that looks like this in standard imaging. You know, you won't be able to see a thing because the power is not enough to, to image an ordinary heart. Uh, on the GE machines, you've got that thing that says there called tissue visualization. And if you press that, it does some clever computer algorithm or something that can give you sort of an indication about where you're looking at the heart uh, to help orientate yourselves, but it's not, uh, it's not perfect, obviously. And then if you take that off and then you start injecting the contrast, as you'll see here, the contrast will start coming into the right side of the heart. There's the right ventricle, right atrium, there it is. You wait a couple of cardiac cycles and then the contrast comes into the left ventricle. So that's showing it coming from the, uh, from the venous circulation through the pulmonary circulation then into the systemic circulation and we're looking at the we're actually doing a study trying to look at the time difference between from when that happens to when that happens and seeing if that's related to cardiac output which makes sense that it does all right blah we'll just skip these cases we kind of gone through these Blah, 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 blah. That's the same we've done there. All right, so here are the false positives. Okay, so if you have your settings wrong, you can see funny things. So this is where I, I, what I've, the settings that I've changed is that I've had this patient on standard settings, but just injected contrast. So you can see that if you forget to turn the power down or you forget to uh, have the mechanical index low and you forget the presets, it almost looks like you've got some kind of filling defects at the top up there. And that's simply because the power of the ultrasound is destroying the bubbles as they come in. Yeah. So that's a potential way you can get a false positive by having the mechanical index too high. The second way you can potentially get a problem, such as we can see down here, Avi, can you see it almost looks like there's a swirling defect and a filling abnormality in there. And if you, have waited too long from when you've given the last bolus, or if you don't have enough contrast coming in, you can get uh, an apparent filling defect simply because there's not enough contrast around. And that's even if you've got the settings right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that would be a way that you can get false positives with either too high mechanical index or not giving enough contrast. I guess you could maybe call this a false positive, but if you then give too much contrast, what you can get is acoustic shadowing at the back. So here at the back, we might have, you could potentially be mistaken for thinking there's a filling defect, and that's because it's super bright at the top up here, which means that the sound waves with their low mechanical index can't get right the way down to the back. 
So uh, those would be the false positives. Okay, this is other uses. So this will go for Vishal's comment. So using pulsed wave or continuous wave Doppler, they talk about using contrast here to improve your Doppler trace. Uh, I haven't got a picture. Every time I've tried this though, you often get a lot of, um, I think you call it flare or something, where if you, it, it's hard to know exactly where the edge is. My, my, when I've, you know, in panel B, this is, I think I've stolen this from some textbook uh, and you know, it looks absolutely perfect. In reality, I find that it's really hard to know where the edge is and it's, because generally you're doing it when you can't get a nice trace with standard imaging and you know, it still makes the imaging difficult, but the theory is, is that having those bubbles around, you get better contrast, but a better definition, but in reality, I don't think it works. And in reality, you know, if, if you've got a trace like this, you know, do we really think that, you know, we've got pulmonary pressures here of three, what's that, three, nine times, yeah, steady. It's, you know, I think, I think probably we'll be looking at other things in the critical year. So I've never actually looked at it for pulse wave itself for things like, uh, cardiac output estimation, but maybe we can give it a go. Um, all right, now this is going to answer your question, Ben. So this is the last, the last sort of uh, bit, bit funny use that we've done a little bit of work on. So for about 20, 30 years, they've been using the idea that the contrast goes into the microcirculation, because that's how it gets from the, the venous side over into the systemic side. So it's got to go through the microcirculation of the pulmonary uh, system but it also goes into the microcirculation of the myocardium. And so the theory is, is that if you look at, don't look at the LV uh, lumen itself, you look at the actual myocardium, you can see bubbles in the myocardium. And what the theory is, is that you can provide a burst of high intensity ultrasound that will destroy the bubbles in that sort of thin film you're looking at. And then you can watch as those bubbles then come back into the myocardium and you can get an idea of what myocardial blood flow is and you can do that non-invasively at the bedside with immediate feedback of results. And, you know, maybe that could start telling you whether there's a significant ischemia. And they use this particularly in exercise stress tests. So this is what it would look like in sort of cartoon form, where you've got a normal ECG with LV opacification, burst of high intensity ultrasound, all the bubbles are destroyed. And then as you go back for each cardiac cycle, you look at the end diastolic phase and you see it, uh, uh, sorry, the um, yeah, the end, uh, the end systolic phase. Sorry, and you can, uh, sorry, that's beginning of diastole. Excuse me. There we go. Beginning of the T-way. Beginning of the end of QRS. Beginning of the T-way. And you've got the uh, bubbles coming back slowly but surely, further and further. And they normally come back within three to five seconds. All right. This is what it looks like. So just focus on the apex. All right. And then you can watch as those little bubbles come back in. Yeah, and they come back in after about five seconds. I'll play it one more time. There you go, and just watch the apex. And bubbles slowly, slowly, you get more and more bubbles coming back in. It's a bit fiddly. It's not super easy. You could do it subjectively like we just did, or you could do it objectively with, uh, with a computer program where you set what's known as a region of interest, and then you can graphically represent sort of how the, the acoustic level comes back in to that, uh, to that little segment that you're looking at and using the rate of rise and the absolute value that you get to, you can use it to try and estimate blood flow. And so the theory goes that you'd be able to tell the difference between, uh, you know, a partially occlusive or an occlusive uh, area. Sorry, just on the graph there, Sam, what, what's the actual y-axis? What is it graphing? So the y-axis is in decibels. So that's the acoustic okay. level or the, the, the amount of whiteness that you've got in that area. So and that, the is that echo measured by yeah. the echo machine? Is that's it? measured by the echo machine. It's the same way as you're looking with your eyes and gradually it gets whiter and whiter as the bubbles come back in. Mm -hmm. That's just a quantitative way of estimating that. Okay. Yeah? And then the, uh, the uh, x-axis is just time. Yeah. And you're just doing one sample point every cardiac cycle. So you yeah. can see from the burst, that's right at the end of the burst. So you go one, two, three, four, five cardiac cycles, you're back at your level. Uh, and 
I might just flick through this a little bit so that we can get onto Ben's question, which is probably a little bit more clinically relevant. So we've done studies in this, particularly looking at those attack at SIBOs, right? So it, that, that when I first heard about this being used for exercise stress tests, my first thought was, well, we often have this dilemma in these sick patients who have risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, being a smoker, a bit of chronic renal failure, they come in with, you know, either it's pneumonia or a subarach or there's something, you know, you have these horrible looking, well, this one's maybe not too bad, but you know, you can often get these horrible ECGs, troponins going up into the thousands. They're a bit sick, you know, you, you don't really want to send them for an angio, you think it's Takatsuba, but you're not sure. And you have these very classic pictures for Takatsuba with, sort of, you know, the horrible apical ballooning. And I'm not suggesting that this replaces angiography, absolutely not. But I have done these, and at least it's reassured me that I think that we've got normal perfusion. So this is that patient. Just again, look at the apex. There's a burst of high-intensity ultrasound. And we can see bubbles flicking around in there pretty quickly within five cycles. And if you try and do the, the imaging, it kind of tells you the same thing. It's a little fiddly. It's not perfect. Hence, it doesn't replace andrography by any stretch of the imagination. But it has at least, you know, helped us decide, you know, maybe we don't need to do it right now. We can do it, you know, we can wait a little bit. And sure enough, they had normal, uh, um, they had normal coronaries in that. All right, blah, 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 we did a study. Um, okay, this is a different guy. Um, just one sec. Okay, um, this is a patient who came in, he came into ED with a very minor cut on his foot, all right? The, he was also noted to then a few days later get short of breath. When he got short of breath with the cut on his foot and him hobbling around, they were worried about a PE, uh, and their CTPA was done that didn't show a PE, but it did suggest there were some lung nodules in his chest, okay? When they were doing the contrast study, they also, for the CT, they also noticed that there was this mass sitting in the right ventricle. So an incidental finding of two lesions in this guy's chest, one in the heart, one in the thorax. Has this gentleman got a, a neoplastic process going on? Yes. There was someone asking if I wanted an ultrasound on a patient, and the answer to that, as we all know, is always yes. Definitely need ultrasound on a patient. Uh, so, yeah, so f funny lesion sitting in the guy's heart. And you can see these in both the uh, axial as well as the um, uh, coronal, uh, uh, coronal images, that there's this decent-sized mass sitting in the right ventricle, right? And so the question was, do you go in and try and sample this or not? Um, it did light up on the, the PET scan. And so what we thought that we might be able to do is using the idea about the myocardial contrast perfusion study, the idea is that if it is a mass, it could be, if it's in the right ventricle, it's a bit of an unusual place for a clot, but certainly we get them there, even though the RV function was okay. But also if it's a tumor, often they are vascular structures. And so in answer to your question, Ben, the way we can try and look at it is using contrast, you can see if you, first of all, you get a filling defect, but also, if, does that filling defect have little bubbles going inside of it? Because if it does have little bubbles going inside of it, it would suggest that it is a vascular structure, which suggests it is a tumor. All right. So that's how I was umming and ahhing when you, were, Ravi, you were asking about the false positives with the tumor, sort of false positives, but you look to see if it's got a vascular supply because a tumor normally does. Some are more uh, obviously um, hematogenous, is that word? Uh, you know, some of them have more blood vessels than others. It's not a word. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Some of them have got blood vessels in, and some of them don't. I think um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but um, maybe I missed it. But the the acrine is the vessels. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's got to be. So so you would ex you would, if it if the wall is achromatic, then you would be very suspicious of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas it doesn't really. It doesn't, but if the wall's contracting normally, for example. And there's still a filling defect, then you'd be like, hang on, that's a pickle. That's exactly right. So I guess clinical context is the same as with all well, the exams, and the clinical context is everything, isn't it? And that goes the same with the context of the heart. Yeah. 
Uh, so you can see the, L, the RV function is okay. These aren't the best images in the world, but they kind of do it. But you can sort of see that mass in there. That is it a moderator band? Is it not? We definitely needed to have some off-axis imaging going on. It was not super easy to scan. But there's definitely some kind of lesion that looks like it's sitting there at the uh, top of the heart. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to loop all these. And that was probably the best one for showing that there was actually a, actually I've got to loop that one, let me just. Excuse me. So, I mean, this was the one for me. I mean, I think that shows that there's a pretty significant lesion there. It looks like it's probably associated with the moderator band as much as anything, but it's definitely a mass that seems to be sitting in there with independent motion. And so what we did is we tried it with contrast. So straight away with the contrast, when we put it in again, it's not the best images in the world, sorry. So there are, there are little, can you, I, I don't know how well it comes up here, but I can see it at this end. There are little bubbles that come through that mass, right? Which means that it's not the moderator band because that's just nerve fibers, right? But it must be some form of tumor that's sitting there with little, little, little things that come through it. Yeah. Maybe it shows up a little bit better on that one. Oh, sorry. So I hope that answers your question, Ben. So that is exactly how we use what's known as myocardial perfusion imaging to try and have a look at blood vessels in there. We can also do it where we can then provide a burst of high intensity ultrasound and see if the bubbles come back. And again, that's a way to try and help show that. But I hope that shows you how we can start using it outside of just LV opacification. We ended up finding out this was a polymorphous adenocarcinoma, just a slow growing tumor. Um, he turned up he had a bit of a history of some head and neck tumors in the past before and maybe this was related to that but they're slow growing weren't causing any problems the, the, the one in the lung was the one that was biopsied and they decided to leave the RV and the other ones from there um, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly right it's, it's either thrombus or infection, and if it's not infection, it's probably thrombus, and after that, it's still probably a thrombus. Yeah, exactly right. Um, okay, that's, that's about it. I'll just sort of wrap it up there before we go through the exam questions. Uh, just to summarize again, you know, it's, it's, it's really easy to do. If you get a chance to do it, I'd do it. It's not super expensive, but you need to have some specific presets on the machine. It's safe, but if you're going to do it, just monitor for cardiorespiratory issues and get consent. Uh, because uh, side effects can occur, but they're extremely rare and they're often not serious. Um, and, uh, you know, some off-label uses. And some of the future developments are absolutely fascinating. And I probably am not allowed to talk about one of them, which I really want to talk about, which they're doing in this exam lab upstairs. But there are some really exciting developments of this in the future, particularly in terms of delivery of drugs, amazingly enough, so that they can potentially uh, add uh, you know chemotherapy agents to these uh, to these drugs and then as you then pump it in when you when you deliver it to an area where you provide the burst of high intensity ultrasound that's when the drug is then released so the drug is only released like for chemotherapy or something only released where the tumor is for example and I thought some of those kind of uses of contrast could be absolutely fascinating so that was really clever um, anyway that's all it guys are there any questions about contrast use in ICU patients Okay, no questions? I'll tell you what, why don't we call that a day then and we'll go through exam questions, but I'll, I'll stop the sharing uh, just uh, at that stage and we'll go from there. All right, well, thanks very much indeed, guys. If you learnt something, hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly. For bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.